How can we hack our history to change our future? So I'm gonna start you with a quote from Socrates. He said, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but on building the new. So our eyes are set towards the future and not focused on all the obstacles of the past. We've been told by modern science that the brain that you have at birth is going to be very similar to the brain you have when you die. At a certain age, it stops building itself, new brain cells stop, being created, and if you have an issue or an injury in your brain, it's permanent. So we've been told this for decades, and we've believed it up until now. Now enter the new paradigm, the new science of neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the ability for your brain to change its structure, its neuronal connectivity. And the reason why this is beautiful, by changing your brain, by hacking into that process of neuroplasticity, we can literally have a brand new brain that serves us in the way that we wish to move forward in our lives. Rather than taking all the baggage with us from our past, we can change, we can move forward, we can be a brand new human. So let's take a look at the history of neuroplasticity. A German physiologist, Friedrich Goltz, in the 1800s, did a hemispherectomy on a dog. Now a hemispherectomy is removing an entire hemisphere of the brain, half of the brain. What he noticed is when the dog recovered, that dog was able to play amongst other dogs. It almost seemed as if there was nothing wrong with that dog. So let me get this straight. If you have half a phone, you have no functionality. Half a car, half a computer, half a camera, you have no functionality to it. But if you have half a brain, you can get along in this world almost exactly the same. John Freeman at Johns Hopkins University, he was a neuroscientist that saw many of these cases of hemispherectomies. And he's quoted as saying, one was a champion bowler of her class, one was a champion chess master of his state, and others are in college doing very nicely. This boggles the mind to think about that even after having half the brain removed, you can still go to college, do well, become a chess master, even a champion bowler. But injury is not required for neuroplasticity to spark up. And we will see in this series, Steps Away from the Future, that even people who have not incurred damage still have these amazing gifts that can happen inside their brain. 377,149,515,625. Rudy Gogam isn't autistic, but he has savant syndrome, which has given him the opportunity to show his extraordinary capacities in calculus on television. To try to understand Rudiger's method, researchers have used a very efficient technique of neuroimaging. Positron emission tomography. Thanks to radioactive markers, we can visualize the cerebral zones that are activated when Rudiger does complicated calculations mentally. 1944. Now, let's do the same experiment with this young guinea pig who isn't a whiz at math like Rudiger. So, where's the difference? The analysis of the results shows that Rudiger uses an additional memory space, his long-term memory. On the contrary, when we do a calculation, we store the intermediate results of our calculations in a small memory space used for work, called our short-term memory. Thus, Rudiger benefits from a bigger mental pocket that has greater storage capacities, which benefits his accomplishments. If you prefer, the mental calculator has the same brain as us anatomically, but he uses it differently. 
So I think one of the keys in Rudy Gogam's case is the fact that he has the same brain, the same hardware as any of us, but he uses it slightly differently. Let's take a look at some memory games, things that we've been told can boost our brain power, boost our memory and our cognitive performance. Dr. Michael Merzenich said, the way to actually use these games in a way that will boost your memory and boost your cognitive performance is by upping the challenge level. So if your skill level is here, simply by boosting the challenge level, you'll actually begin prompting neuroplasticity. So giving yourself a time limit in a crossword puzzle or trying a challenge that's a little bit outside your comfort zone, this actually allows for the brain to strive for something more. Professor Don Vaughn from UCLA, along with many of his colleagues, created an app called Chatterbaby. This app was created for deaf and blind parents that are having trouble connecting with their child. So what they found was that with acute training, the deaf parents that could not hear the nuances of their baby crying, that gave very rich and valuable information with what's wrong with their child or what their child needs, they were able to focus on what they were seeing, the body language, the facial expressions, and in their mind's ear, if you will, they were able to hear the sound that they were missing. Conversely, the blind parents that weren't able to see the body language, but were able to hear just fine, were then able to tap into what they were hearing, all the nuances of it, the cries, the chatter that their baby displayed. And in all those nuances, it would translate into the visual cortex of this blind parent. So in the mind's eye, they were able to see, and in this way, they were able to connect with their child in much more of a beautiful way. This is just one of the many examples of how neuroplasticity is truly remarkable in allowing for certain impulses to translate themselves into what's missing in our lives. What are the actual conditions that prompt our brain to restructure itself? The first one is attention. The second one is the duration of your attention and the intensity of it. How deeply you're actually focusing on what you're looking to focus on. The next one is constraint and immersion. Meaning if you can constrain your focus and leave out all the distractions, all the things that'll pull your attention away, constrain your attention into what you would like to focus on and immerse yourself in that one little aspect, then this is a condition for neuroplasticity as well. And the final two are imitation and visualization. Let's actually give another example. Imagine you go to the movies because you want simply to be entertained. You don't want to put any brain power in, you just want to sit in that seat and be entertained by the movie. But you're sitting right next to somebody who has come to watch the movie to study the craft of screenwriting. So they're sitting there from the same vantage point watching the same exact movie, but their brain will prompt neuroplasticity because they choose to learn. They focus their attention on very unique things that they would like to learn. So they set the framework for neuroplasticity, whereas you, sitting in the very next seat, just wish to be entertained, so no neuroplasticity pops up. So now I wanna show you an episode of The Science of Happiness, New Neural Pathways with Ashley Sargent. Your type of mind, my type of mind, used to be able to hide behind that idea of, oh, you know, I'm too, it's too late in my life to start meditating or some of my, you know, thought patterns are just so deep, there's no way I'm going to change them. And actually science used to kind of go along with that, with this idea that after actually like nine years of age, it's kind of downhill <laughs> and we're actually um, degenerating in the brain. But neuroscience now, and particularly a branch of neuroscience called neuroplasticity, shows us that actually new neural pathways are able to be created throughout our entire life. That being said, it's like what we're actually able to do is to create new patterns and new habits of thinking of the way that the brain works whenever we want. 
Growing new brain cells is a process called neurogenesis. And this is very important to us because many of the modern lifestyle stressors, the pollutants, and the things that we engage in on a daily basis damage our brain cells. So if we are now realizing that we are able to create new brain cells, that there are ways that we can actually generate this new neural structure, then we have the power to completely rebuild and completely restructure our brain to better serve us moving forward on this path. We know now that novel and functional forms of movement prompts neuroplasticity and neurogenesis later in years, no matter how old you are. We know that foods like blueberries and chocolate, that high intensity exercise and aerobic exercise can prompt neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. There are more, but let's just stick with functional movement and novel movement. Functional means the biomechanical way that your body was designed to move with nature. Novel means new, unique ways that your body can move, perhaps was even designed to move, but it doesn't. And by doing these things, that's when we start to notice this pickup of neurogenesis and neuroplasticity inside the brain. These things actually strengthen the mind-body maps. And what a mind-body map is, is your mind being able to know exactly where your body is in space and time and feel confident that if it gives a command, your body can execute that perfectly. But to be fair, I want to balance the conversation here. Greg Downey, he's an anthropologist and the co-author of a popular blog, Neuroanthropology. He says, I've seen tremendous exaggeration. People are so excited about neuroplasticity that they talk themselves into believing anything. So yes, Greg is very right. This is a natural human condition for us to exaggerate, to extrapolate meaning from what we hear, to go beyond what the data is showing us. And this must be irritating to some people. However, I believe this is also one of our gifts, the ability to speculate, the ability to go beyond what science has proven that we can do, because we know that what they have measured is only what we've done in the past, but it does not determine where we can go in the future. <laughs>